Hello, thank you all for, for coming to my talk. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Martin Kuchera. I come from Prague, and I work there as a software engineer at Emotic. And today, I want to tell you a story about a Scala library called Taiku. The story starts in August last year, where I was still a student at ETH Zurich, and I was looking for a topic for my master's thesis, and I was looking for something really cool. And at that time, I thought I wanted to do maybe something in graph theory, something more theoretical. Um, but I was struggling to find a nice professor to do it with. Because all the cool professors that I knew, they were in the department of mathematics, and I was in the department of computer science. And when I went to talk to them, they were like, well, well you know, we have enough students from our own department, actually, more than we can accommodate. So, you know, sorry for you. Um, and then I was really mm, like sad about this, and I was telling it to a colleague of mine, and he was like, well, didn't you say that you really liked Scala? And I was like, yeah, I did. I did say that. And then he said, well, why don't you go to EPFL and do your thesis with Martin Odersky? And I thought, well, this is such a stupid idea. Like, I don't know that much about Scala, and I know nothing about compilers, and I don't know nothing about the programming language theory or type theory or anything like that. Um, so I went home, and then I kept thinking about it. And in the end, I was like, well, I can try to send an email to him. So I wrote an email, and I was writing it for maybe a few hours. And then I spent another few hours just looking at the email and hovering over the send button and not sure if I should send it or not. And in the, in the end, it was like midnight, and I was already really tired. And I finally hit the send button because I was like, well, he's not going to reply anyway, so what can go wrong? And then the, the next day, I got the reply. And he said, well, let's talk. Um, so we had a Zoom call. And I told him that I like databases. And I was like, well, you should come and make a new Scala library to query databases. And that was it. And the next month, I was already an exchange student at DPFL. And I was starting my master's thesis, which was called TypeSafe SQL Queries in Scala. Uh, so I guess this is like the first already like small takeaway from, from this talk, is that if you want something from someone, then you should go for it and ask them nicely, and you might be surprised, um, especially so if it's someone from the Scala community. And then the second takeaway, and that will be the rest of the talk, uh, I hope I will convince you that Taiku is pretty cool. Um, so let's go into it, and let's, let's talk about some queries. Um, but before we start talking about queries, I want to quickly show you this little database schema, just to make things a bit more concrete, because all the queries that I will show you will be like running against this schema. So this is a little uh, music database called Discox. So you can find it online. Um, and there are three main like entities that we will be uh, talking about. They are artists, releases, and tracks. And then, as you might expect, there is like a many-to-many -many relationships between artists and releases because every artist can have many releases, and also every release could be made by multiple artists collaborating together. And then, of course, on a release, there are multiple tracks. So, so this is the database that we will be uh, having in all our examples. OK, now for the queries. So first of all, I guess most of you here will agree with me that for most use cases, uh, talking to a database this way is maybe not the best. Um, so here we just use the standard like Scala SQL library, we connect the database, then we write the query as string and send it to the database and wait what we get back. Uh, there are several problems with this approach. Uh, the, the, I listed here like the three that I thought are the most important. So query composition, meaning like it's, if you write a query as a string, it's hard to create something dynamically if you want to, let's say, filter based on what the user decided. Then you have to concatenate strings, and it's not very convenient to work with. Security, of course, SQL injection. Um, I guess no need to go into detail there. But then I guess the most interesting and important one for this talk is type safety. So what exactly do I mean by type safety? Uh, I would like classify it into two categories uh, with respect to SQL queries. So the first category is like type safety issues that can occur when we're executing our query on the database side. And the second category is issues that occur 
after we run the query and we get back the result and we treat it in some wrong way. So let's see some examples. Uh, this is the first category. So here we have a query select star from artists where name grade or equals seven. Right, so obviously the database is not going to know what to do with that because name is of type string and seven is an integer. So if we were to execute this code, we would get a runtime exception from the database. So this is obviously something that we would like to avoid. And then the second type of uh, issue that could occur is when we have a completely correct query, like here, select star from tracks. Uh, we execute the query. It runs correctly, we get back the result, and then we try to iterate over the rows, and we just print the position and the title for each of the tracks. So I wonder if anyone sees what might be the problem here, because I think this one is pretty tricky. Uh, so let me show you what happens when you run this code. You get an exception. Uh, it says PSQL exception bad value for type int A. So the problem is here on line four, where we try to get the position and we say it's an integer. And in fact, it's not true, even though it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Because this is tracks and the position says like, what is the number of the track on the album? But it turns out that this Discox database, it has like a lot of even like old music and it has LP records on it. And those LP records, they usually have letters A or B to signify which side of the LP record the track is on. And so position is actually of type string. And when we try, try to get it as an int, we get an exception. So this, I think, is a kind of error that can easily happen when you like, don't know what you're exactly working, about, uh, working with. And so it would be nice to have some support from somewhere like outside, like somewhere automatic that, that kind of catches this error at compile time and doesn't let us do it. So that's why we have libraries, right? So I think that's what most, most people do today. Is they don't use directly Java SQL, but they use some library, which makes sure that we don't make these kind of errors. It, it makes sure that we get compile errors when we try to do that. Uh, it also fixes like, the other problems that I listed before, like query composition, uh, SQL injection. It gives us uh, also a nicer API to work with. So perfect. Um, so now I would like to make a little survey out of curiosity. How many people here have used Slick before? Quite a few, OK. And how many people have used Quill? A bit less, but also quite a lot. Uh, has someone used Juke? Even less. And has anyone used Doobie? Oh, quite a lot. That's, that's surprising. Yeah. Uh, and has anyone used anything else that I didn't list with, from within Scala? A few, OK. So I think we've covered most of the common libraries that people use. And so since we have like a lot of them, and they seem to work quite well, why, why did we want to create another library? So the answer to that is that Scala 3 has some really cool new features. Uh, I list, again, like the most interesting one here. And these libraries were usually created in like Scala 2, and maybe they're doing something towards migrating to Scala 3, now a bit better than at the time when I started. Uh, but even still, they don't use this to the fullest, I would say. And so the question was, like, what can we do? Can we do something really cool if we use all of this like, to the max? And so I'm going to now explain briefly these structural types, which, which are like the most crucial part. Uh, if you were at Guillaume's talk in the morning, I think he also mentioned them at some point. Uh, so here. We have a class called record, and it takes some fields, which is a map from string to any. And then it defines a method called select dynamic, which takes a name, and then it returns the corresponding field. So what makes this interesting is that it extends the selectable trait, which is something that's defined directly in Scala. And what it does is when you try to access a field on record, which is not defined, uh, it will instead try to call the select dynamic method, and it will pass the name of the field as the, as the argument. So like, for example, here I create a val person, which is a record that has name Emma and age 42. Now I could try to print the name of the person. So this should, in theory, because there is no val name, it should call select dynamic with the parameter string name. Well, of course, this is not going to happen if I just compile the code like this right now. 
uh, because it's not going to type check. So the type checker will see this, and it will not know what person.name is, what type should it have, or, or even that it's defined. But there's a little hack that we can do to convince the ch type checker that it, this is OK, and then we will be able to actually see the result of calling select dynamic. So, so this little tweak that we have to do is we have to cast person uh, to something which is an intersection of record and an object which has a val name string and a val age int. And when we do that, like, like this, we can run this code. It will compile, and it will print out Emma. So this is something that, again, like just by itself, it's maybe not that cool, but it starts being really cool when you employ macros. Because with macros, you can generate this cast automatically. And so you can think of this uh, record as representing a row from the database. And of course, like when I'm writing the library, I don't know what your da database looks like. And even more so, I have no idea what query you're running. right? And so there are like countless of possibilities of what, projects, what projections you could do or joins. And with a macro, I can simply like look at your query, generate this uh, structural type for you, and then you can print person.name. So this was a this was, uh, big piece of the puzzle. And actually, uh, here is the issue that uh, Indotti describes the structural types, how they should be in Scala 3. I'm not going to read it out to you, but I encourage you, if you're interested, check it out online. And just to summarize, it really describes how the structural types look like. It gives very, a very similar example to what I just showed you. And it argues why we need this in Scala. And the argument that it gives is it says we need this to be able to conveniently work with databases. OK. So we have this really cool new feature in Scala 3, which was made for databases. And we have no database library using this feature. So this was, this was like the main motivation why to try something new. OK. Uh, so now we're ready to uh, talk about TyQ. Um, and to start with, we have to describe the schema to type, type Q so that it can type, type check for you uh, all the good stuff. Um, so yeah, there is an object for every table in the database. And the object has a field for every column. So this is pretty straightforward. Right? Here, here we have a column ID, which is of type int, and it's the primary key. And then analogically, we have title and genre, which are of type string. And then there will be some more columns if only I had more space on the screen. But since I don't, I just skip them for now. And here, just for completeness, there's one more table tracks. Again, the same idea. And again, there will be two more tables, artists and release by if I wanted to show you the full schema, but it doesn't fit on the screen. Um, one more slightly unexpected thing that you can put here is the relationships between uh, the different tables. So here I put. Uh, the relationships of, of releases with tracks. So releases have a one-to-many relationship to tracks. And also, tracks have a many-to-one relationship to releases. So this will give us some nice like syntactic sugar for, for joins later. OK, once we have the schema, we can start querying. And so here, I'm going to show you a query uh, which finds all the tracks by Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I first show it in some like pseudo library that should resemble Slick or Quill. They're like both very similar, at least for this particular query. And then I will compare it to TyQ. OK, so if we want to get all the tracks, well, first of all, we have to define some case class into which we store the result, right? Um, so let's say that we want to select the track name, duration, and the release that the track comes from. So when we, once we have this, this case class, we can start querying. And we start from tracks, and then we join the releases, and then we join the release by, and then we join the artists. And it's all a bit clumsy, right, because we're using these tuples, because whenever we join two tables, what we get is like a tuple where the first element is the table on the left, the second element is the table on the right. And then we, when we join another table, we get a nested tuple where the first element is the original tuple, and the second element is the new table. So yeah, it works, but it's kind of weird. Well, OK. Then we filter by the artist name, and we map onto the query result. And here we see like the full ugliness of the tuples. Um, so I really don't like these tuples, but fortunately, this is something that we can still, within Slick or Quill, get rid of uh, by using four comprehensions. 
So this is quite a bit better because we named all the tables and then we refer by the table like names instead of the uh, tuple indices. But still, there are some things that I think could be improved. So one that really annoys me is having to define this case class query result, which is like specific for the specific query. And for every new query, I would have to define a new case class. Or I could store the result in a tuple. But then again, I also don't really like that because accessing the elements by their numbers, it's, it's kind of yeah, not very convenient. And another thing that I think is a bit inconvenient is having to explicitly write these joining conditions everywhere which I think in many cases is rather a property of the schema than of the query itself, even though there might be some exceptions. So let's see how you'd write the same query in TyQ. So first of all, we have no query result here. We don't have to define a case class. And second of all, we don't have uh, any like, explicit joins. So instead, what we do is we just go from tracks, and then we filter. And we say that for each, fill, for each track, we want to look at the release of that track. And then we want to look at all the artists that the track has. And then we want that there exists one whose name is Red Hot Chili Peppers. And finally, we do the map. And here is something a bit weird, because we map to a tuple, even though before I said I didn't like tuples. Um, but the thing is that the map here is a bit magical. And it will, using those structural types that I showed you before, convert this tuple to an object which has the fields track duration and release. Uh, so this maybe looks a bit weird or surprising right now, uh, but that's why this is the time for a demo. And I hope when I show you how I do this live, it will be more natural and uh, nice. OK, so here I have some code prepared uh, just to show you that this is nothing like magical. I mean, I just have some dependencies, imports, and then he, I, here I have the schema that I showed you in the slide, but it's the complete one um, with all the columns and tables that I didn't define in the slides. And then here I have the main method, and here I just connect to the database, and then I create this uh, PostgreSQL query executor, which is something that TechU needs in order to execute the query. And then here I have a uh, textual description. Oh, by the way, maybe I should make this a bit bigger even more. That's better, right? So I have a textual des description of the query that I want to write. And it says, find all artists who have at least 10,000 seconds of released music, at least one release in the genre classical, and their name starts with the letter B. So it's quite a complex query, right? So let's see how we would write that. Um, so firstly, Every query starts with the keyword from, which kind of says which table we want to select from. So we want to select from artists. And I would like to pay attention to how VS Code is giving me hints for basically like everything that I write. So we want to filter. And we want to filter based on the seconds of the released music, right? So for each artist has some releases. And each release, uh, we can map, or rather flat map. So the releases have some tracks, right? So when I did this, now I have all the tracks of the respective artist. And now I can map the tracks to their duration. Now I can sum that. So now I have the seconds of, of release music, and I want that to be at least 10,000. Uh, OK. Seems to work. And then I do the, another filter, and I want at least one release from the genre classical. OK, so similarly, I want to look at the releases. And I want that there exists one whose genre is classical. OK, now before I do the last filter, I'm first going to do a map just to show you some other cool stuff. So let's say that we only want to select uh, the name and the real name of the artist. Right? So the, the name is like the pseudonym, and the real name is the real name. 
So we have the name here. And let's say we're also a bit lazy and we don't want to write name every time. We're just going to call it M. OK, and then A dot real name. And now you see that real name is of type string or null. So it's nullable. So let's just say get or else. And if we don't have the real name, let's just make it a minus. And then let's call it rn because we're lazy again. OK. And so now let's do the last filter. And now you see the reason why I showed you the map before. Because now if you look at the, what VS Code is hinting me, we see that there's the n and rn, which I created here. So by calling this s, I kind of changed the name of this thing. And also, I, because I mapped everything else that was there before, like the releases or what else was on artists, like uh, ID profile, that's not there anymore because I mapped. But I still have the name, which I wanted to start with the letter B. So I say N starts with B. And this is the query. Now I can run the query. So I say Q.execute. And then I can get the result back. So I say for each row. And let's say I just print them out. So I'm going to print name and again when I write row here it gives me n and rn they're both of type string real name okay this is the code that I wanted to show you. Now let's try to run it and see what happens. And it ran, and it gave me back some names and real names. Here we can see that this one didn't have any, so it gave me, gave me the minus instead. And this is it. I originally wanted to do a longer demo, but everyone discouraged me from, me from it because they said things will break and it won't be good. And so I changed it to just one query, but I think it kind of illustrates uh, what type you can do. If you want to see more queries, maybe come talk to me after the talk. So now let's go back to the slides and I will tell you a bit about how Taiku is implemented. I won't go into much details about like the hardcore macros and stuff because I think it's like pretty late in the conference and everyone is already a bit tired. Uh, but I will just briefly like mention some of the interesting stuff. And so the first important thing to say is that TaiQ doesn't generate the queries at compile time, which a lot of people have found a bit disappointing. Uh, but the reason is that it would be much harder to implement that and Right now, we're more at the, like a prototype phase, and so it was more convenient to generate queries at runtime because then we can like move faster and change things. Uh, so the only thing that happens at compile time is that we generate the types, like these structural types that I showed you before, so that we can type check everything and we can, we can get the type safety guarantees. But so when we write a query, uh, I would basically divide it into like three stages. The first one is query building, so that's where we call this like from tracks, and then we call this map filter and similar methods. So this builds like the query in some object representation. And then there's the translation to an SQL query, and then finally the execution and getting back the result. So I think the first two are more interesting. The last one, then already like when you've seen the first two, it, it, it's kind of like relatively clear what how how you can do the execution. So about the query building. There's this huge class, which is like the central piece of the library. It's called the query builder. And again, this is like what you get as a result of the from function. And then you have all these methods that help you generate the query. And the, the actual like shape of the query is stored in these uh, fields of the class. So we can see that these fields really correspond to the clauses of the SQL query, uh, with the exception of the scope here, which kind of represents the select clause in the query, but it actually represents a bit more 
because it tells us like also for when we call map, it tells us what we can actually use within the map or when we call filter or something like that. And it's also the type of the scope is, store, is stored as a type parameter here in the query builder, which is again for the type safety. So that also like VS code sees uh, what we actually have in the scope and what we can access while writing the query. So I'm going to zoom in a bit into this map function because this should give you a bit of an idea how, how also like all the rest is implemented. And the thing here is that the signature of the function is a bit more complicated than what I showed. Because, well, here we see that like, what the signature says here is we map the current scope S to some different scope S2, but actually we map to tuples which get transformed to the scope by some macro magic. So to express that in the signature, uh, we need to make it a bit larger. So we say we map to some out type, which is either scope or tuple. And then what we return, we don't know anymore, right? So before it said we return query builder of S2, which is the result of this mapping. But now it's query builder of question mark because we don't know what we're going to return. And what is it that we're going to return? Well, we get that uh, from a macro call. So the, like the implementation of map is actually very simple because we just call on this macro, which is called query builder factory dot from map. Uh, because we're calling a macro, we have to make the function inline. That's just uh, how macros work. Uh, but now, like the interesting stuff happens inside the macro. And so what the macro basically does is uh, it generates some code, which like just copies the query builder, and then it casts it to something that has the correct types that we want. So in particular, I'm not going to show the implementation of the macro, but I'm going to show like if you had some specific query that you call that you called map on, and then you compile the code this call to the macro would get replaced by whatever the macro returns. And so in particular, it would be something like this. So we see that here we first call the function scope, uh, the function on scope. We get like the new selection. And then we just copy the query builder. We create a new instance of, of the scope of that selection. And then we cast it. We cast it to a query builder. Of, and here we have the structural type, right? So we, we cast. We cast a query builder of tuf tuple scope, intersection, and something generated by a macro. And the, the, the thing that's generated by the macro is exactly like, so it analyzes the, so and this is the tuple case, right? So it analyzes the elements of the tuple, and for each of them, it looks like what type is it, what, the, what name does it have, and then it generates the corresponding file with that name here. And so this is basically how map works. And yeah, and of course, we have to make it transparent. So this is just like a fancy way that how we tell Scala that we want the return type in the end to not be query builder question mark, but to actually like inherit the type that we wrote here with the macro. So, so all of this that's written here, including this the thing that's not written here, like this commented thing, this will all get propagated into the return type. And that's why VS Code then sees what the type is. And this is the, this is basically this is basically how map is implemented, and uh, and it's it's very like similar how the other methods are implemented. You just call a macro which derives some type, and then just does like the regular copying thing with modifying the query. Okay, uh, now about the translation, um, just like a small remark, uh, something to be aware of. So you don't have to like, really scan of what this query does. Just like look at the look at it visually, and now here's the SQL that it generates. And again, it just like if you look at it visually, like the the unfortunate thing that you see is that there are two subqueries in it. And so like generally, TyQ likes to generate subqueries a lot compared to joins. Uh, the reason is that again, it's like easier to implement, or I should say. In many cases, it's actually like it's used to be the more correct way. Because, for example, like in, in this query here, uh, what we do is like we go from releases and then we filter by their artists something. Now, the problem is if we generated like a join for this, there could like hypothetically happen a situation which like in this database is not going to happen, but hypothetically it could, where we, give, where we had like two artists that were called Red Hot Chili Peppers. They both collaborated on the same release. And then we would get this release twice if we, if we used a join. 
So this is kind of an awkward situation, which, which like, in this case, can probably not going to happen, but in general, it could. That's why uh, I chose to implement most of the stuff as subqueries. And this has some unfortunate uh, potential uh, performance implications, right? Because uh, so it's obvious that the performance of subqueries and joins might not be the same. And in practice, sometimes the subqueries can be faster, but a lot of the times they're slower. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. And then maybe just one other like slightly positive thing is that I will I, I like to think that the queries that it generates they at least like look nice. So if you compare to some other libraries, often they make like some weird aliases for everything that they select, so then it's like impossible to read. So here everything is called the way that you called it, and it may and it's like nicely formatted and it makes it easy to read and to like convince yourself that the query is doing what you wanted it to do. So future work, there are quite a lot of things that are not implemented yet, uh, but hopefully soon in the future. Uh, maybe the one that's like closest to being there is prepared queries. So the idea here is that you write the query once and you have some like uh, placeholder parameters that you can fill in later. So we can call the query multiple times with different parameters. This is like almost implemented in some side branch. It just has some little problems that need to be solved. And the nice thing here is that you can actually wrap this whole like prepared query call into a macro yourself. And if you do that, you actually get the compile time queries. So this can be quite useful if you want to get some extra performance. It's not the like nicest way because you have to create a macro yourself and there is nothing simple that we could do to like save you that trouble, but it's really like two or three extra lines of code that you would have to write and then you get compile time queries like very easily. So this is one cool thing that should be there soon. And then the other thing that I think is very important to have is explicit joins. So we don't have that right now. The only way to, to write a join is using the flat map. And as we saw that tends to sometimes generate sub queries which are not optimal. Um, so we would like to have also just explicitly writing left join, right join, outer join. Oh, and by the way, we cannot even actually do that because the flat map will always just generate an inner join, right? Uh, but still, even if we had those joins, uh, we can, we could get rid of having to write this on clause uh, because we have the like joining condition encoded in the schema. So if we like, let's say in, instead of the table name here, we could put uh, like the table dot column or something so that we know which join we want to do, we could get rid of this on clause and we have like a bit more convenient way still to write the joins. And then of course, as I said before, I don't like tuples, so there won't be any tuples. Instead, the, the join will get flattened to just one structure and it, there, it will have prefixes which correspond to the table names. Like here we see that we have s.tracks.title and s.releases.genre. Just nicer, nicer way to work with it than with tuples. And here I would like to give some credit to Iskra, which is a library for type save. It's like a type save wrapper for Apache Spark. Uh, and it's a really nice library that I got a lot of inspiration from both for the API. So, so like this is something specifically that they do exactly like that. Uh, but also for other things and also for a lot of like implementation details. So if you're interested in Apache Spark, uh, definitely check out Iskra. Okay, so some other things that I would like to have in the future. Uh, again, this is like one last that is like super, super important is uh, insert update delete. So there's something that we don't support right now. And I guess for like some real production adaptation, it would be necessary to have that. It's maybe a bit more work than the previous two. Single row queries, that's just to say that like if I select only one row, I don't want the result to be a collection of rows, but just one row. That would just be like a nice syntactic sugar. Async should be pretty straightforward. Making ready for customization, just meaning like some of the hard-coded stuff there could be replaced by something that's easier to extend by the users. Also shouldn't be super difficult. Uh, transactions, 
generating the schema from uh, from the database and it's also in reverse it should also be relatively straightforward migrations and maybe some more stuff that you guys will recommend so to conclude uh thank you uses some really cool new features like structural types match types macros explicit nulls it's also built with scala cli which i think not many projects have tried that before and I also managed to break the Scala 3.3 compiler. <laughs> uh, so thank you right now is being compiled with Scala 3.2, uh, because if you try to compile it with Scala 3.3, it just throws a runtime exception and breaks down. So uh, we might actually try to fix that tomorrow at the spree, uh, but <laughs> let's, see. let's see if we can do that or not. And finally, yeah, I like to think that it lets you type it lets you write type safe SQL queries in a very convenient fashion. And it just works. Well, somewhat. So <laughs> you saw that there are still a lot of things missing. And so here I would like to encourage you, if you liked it, uh, please let me know. Check it out on GitHub. Maybe it's not production ready yet, but you can try to play with it and maybe report some issues. And yeah, it. it if, if you let me know that, that you like it, it would be a great motivation for me to continue working on it and maybe make it production ready soon. So thank you very much.